thanks a lot for joining us. But I'll just do a very quick uh, introduction uh, for Mr. Ayer here. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Ayer is uh, a career bureaucrat, but he's been somebody who's very, very significant uh, in the India development uh, story. Uh, if you really look at it, the whole idea of sanitation uh, that we are really talking about and the open defecation program that was run by the government of India, he is the sole person who was actually running it, or I think he is the person responsible for the success of that program. What we have seen is an amazing uh, uptick of uh, usage of toilets and so on and so forth. The program is just a wonderful example of how scaled up solutions can actually be brought out uh, in the world. Uh, of course, he's, he's worn very many hats over a period of time, until uh, recently. Uh, he, he is still the CEO for Niti Aayog, but now he's actually moving to the World Bank. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think uh, he's in that transition phase, and that's where it is. But uh, one more thing, uh, Mr. Ayer and I are also uh, editing a book on water and governance, uh, which should be out uh, sometime soon. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we have uh, uh, Michael Green, who is associating with that. He's not in the room right now, but he's also helping us really put those uh, thoughts together. Uh, so, Mr. Ayer, I'll not come between you and the audience. I'll, uh, uh, in fact, Mr. Ayer is actually going to talk about improvement in quality of life in India. Uh, so that is the uh, whole idea of social progress that we've been talking since morning. Uh, so, Mr. Ayer, over to you, please. Yeah, so I was just saying thank you very much, Amit. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Good evening, Del. Great to, I was listening to uh, Dr. Debroy's excellent summing up of the last session for the last few minutes. Also nice to see Pawan there and uh, uh, the very distinguished audience in Stanford. I believe Dr. Virmani, member uh, from Niti Aayog, is also uh, participating in this conference. So I wish I could have been there, but uh, as you mentioned, Amit, it's a bit of a transition here in Niti. Uh, in fact, today is my last official day here, I'm going to sort of relinquish charge and sort of getting ready for the next challenge, which is uh, India's executive director at the World Bank. It's going to be a very interesting time. We just saw the, the nomination of Ajay Banga uh, as the next president of the World Bank. So I think the next couple of years will be uh, even more interesting uh, than they are typically in Washington. But let me come today uh, to the topic of this presentation. And, you know, some of the things which, are, which will definitely resonate with many of you is how India over the last eight or nine years has really delivered uh, at scale, but also with speed. And we're talking of not just basic services, but we're talking of delivering services for an aspirational India. And uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not going to take very long. I've got only seven or eight slides, but very happy to take questions and comments uh, if you have any. So this is the theme, improving quality of life in India uh, at speed and scale. Uh, if, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, just to give you some numbers, uh, which many of you are familiar with, but uh, just to show how the rapid progress India has made uh, over the last several years, you know, whether you talk of us being the fastest growing large economy, you know, uh, still 7% at a time of global headwinds and uncertainty. India's uh, growth has been quite resilient. Of course, uh, and if you look at macroeconomic fundamentals, which Dr. De Broglie can tell you much more about, we, are, uh, we have done quite well. And then if you look at you know, these other numbers in terms of the smartphone data consumer, we have got 800 million internet users. So it, it's number one in terms of global fintech. If you want to talk of retail development index, internet users, and of course, Amit and the Institute for Competitiveness have helped uh, the government and Niti and the economic advisory to the prime minister a lot on in terms of the ranking, but also of state governments. And you heard Dr. De Broy talking about it. So with the startup ecosystem, I'll come to that in a bit. Energy consumer, we are number three. And if you look at our economy by PPP, purchasing power parity, we're number three. So important to note that Prime Minister Modi, for the first time ever in India, started has started talking about how India can become a developed economy by, 1940, by 2047, which is the 100th uh, anniversary of our independence. So this is very firmly on the agenda. So the next 25 years, big picture is India to become a, a developed economy 
by 2047. What is it going to take to get there? Uh, the building blocks are being set in place. It's a long way to go, but given the, the performance over the last eight or nine years, uh, we're confident that, you know, that we are well within that growth trajectory. Next, please. Okay, so we're going to, I'm first coming to sort of basic services and infrastructure. And what, how did India deliver on this? What did it take? We'll talk a little bit about that. Next, please. Okay, now let's talk of scale. And uh, Amit made a reference to the Swaj Bharat mission, which is the Clean India campaign, uh, where Prime Minister Modi took the world by storm. I was sitting with my wife in our apartment in Vietnam. I was working in the World Bank country office. And when he made this huge announcement, in many ways, a bhag, a big, hairy, audacious goal, where he said, okay, by 2nd October 2019, in five and a half years, India is going to become open defecation free. And considering that, you know, toilet coverage was minimal, was what, 39% at the time. It was a big announcement, a risky announcement to me. And that was the Swaj Bharat mission which turned out to be the largest behavior change campaign in the world. And that's important because the focus was on changing behavior. It's very, very difficult, as we all know. How do you change the mindset? People traditionally defecating in the open, being comfortable with that, but also leading to huge problems in terms of health, dignity, and security of women and girls who had to go out in the dark. So it was a big challenge. And when he made that announcement, so basically, the government led by the prime minister, who incidentally happened to be our communicator in chief, all the way from mass media down to having boots on the ground, uh, you know, in terms of behavior change agents who were trained. So the country went uh, to an open uh, defecation free status in five years. And of course, uh, you know, 110 million household toilets, large scale individual household toilets. That was a big number. So infrastructure was important, but even more important was changing behavior so that people actually used the toilets which were constructed and understood the importance of that. And then you take the Ujwala program. I'm just giving you these uh, big numbers to show you the scale of these things. So, you know, 370 million uh, LED bulbs distributed. Uh, again, huge energy saving, but also transforming uh, lives and quality of life. And I'm not going to read out all those numbers. If you look at the financial inclusion program, the Jan Dhan Yojana, which essentially India was, you know, at that point in 2014, relatively unbanked. And therefore, 418 million bank accounts were open. And this really benefited women and girls so that they had access to banking. So when you talk of financial inclusion, that's a very concrete example of how India delivered on that at scale. And then you can see some big numbers in terms of the balance and beneficiary accounts as well. And then the Judge Even Mission, the drinking water program, which I started in my last stint as Secretary in the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, which is in full steam now. And look at the numbers. The target was to provide 190 million house functioning household tap connections, which again, Look at the improvement in quality of life if, uh, you know, both village, villages mainly, but also in urban areas. In rural areas, uh, guess who is going to fetch water from anywhere from, you know, a half a kilometer to a kilometer away? It's the women and girls, right? So look at the improvement in quality of life if you have a tap, of, you know, something that all of us take for granted in your house. So the Jaldi even mission, which is already at almost 60% coverage, that task will be completed sometime next year. And another major transformational program at scale, which is underway in India. And uh, that's another example of scale. Next, please. Okay. Avas is housing, as many of you would know. So already affordable houses to 30 million householders, you know, you can compare it with the population of, uh, of Australia. Direct benefit transfer, another way in which of uh, beneficiaries would for welfare programs would get money are getting money directly in their bank accounts as opposed to in the previous governments money being stolen along the line and uh, so this program if you look at digital transfer through direct benefit into the bank account of beneficiaries 
it eliminates middlemen, it eliminates you know, corruption at different levels. And so beneficiaries actually get the funds for their programs. So, and then they can take charge of it. So this is another huge uh, program at scale. Health insurance, Ayushman Bharat, you know, the world's largest health insurance scheme for almost 500 million Indians. Again, as we know, uh, the catastrophic uh, cost uh, affecting you know, everything for a family if you're not insured. So very strong uh, safety net. And this program is being scaled up even more. Rural electrification, India is electrified now, particularly the last push was given over the last eight years. So these are all examples of scale and more or less basic services, infrastructure, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the number of kilometers of roads, a big push to implementation at scale and provision of basic services to our people. That was the first priority of the Modi government in its first term from 14 to 19. And then now we're moving into a more of an aspirational India. Uh, what has the government done for the middle class? And what, what is the sort of next level, if you like, of services and facilities which are available? Let's move to the next slide, please. So now we're talking about aspirational India. Let me also say that uh, you can get much more from Dr. De Bruyne and Dr. Vermani. India, has, you know, in terms of poverty, we're down to what? About 14, 15%. Today, uh, there are because of the, the the services provided and the increase in income levels, there are more than 400 million people living in that middle class range, however you define it, 400 to 500 million. And this is because the government focused on poverty alleviation, multidimensional aspects of poverty. So now we're talking of an aspirational India, which is really driving the economy in many ways. So even if you know there's a, there are global headwinds on the economy, we have a large thriving middle class market and a large consumer market as well, which is driving growth. Next, please. So you know you're going to hear about the digital story. You must have already heard it, and I know my predecessor Amitabh, who's now the Sherpa, is going to talk to you about digital. And in many ways, if you look at this story, this is. You know, a lot of you know about it, but just look at the scale of the digital revolution in India, which is transforming India and actually in many ways contributing to world growth as well. If you just look at inclusiveness, it, people talk of the digital divide in India. If you look at Aadhaar, which is a digital identity, you know, 1.2 or 1.3 billion people have a digital identity. And, uh, you know, I've always reminded people in India, uh, when I lived, I've lived for 16 years in the US and I still got my tattered CVS vaccine card, you know, hard copy, which I have to carry around and I used to show in airlines when they ask for it. In India, everyone's got a, a digital vaccine certificate through COVID. And therefore, digital, the backbone of digital, if you, whether you're talking about identity, whether you're talking of the scale of the internet push down, if you're talking of the the 1.2 billion uh, mobile phone users. And then we look at the, the digital economy, the transactions through the United Payments interface. In December 22, there were 7 billion transactions. So today, as all of you know, if you're, there's a street vendor, you're driving through a street in Delhi and someone comes and asks you for 10 rupees, they put out, you can, you can do it digitally. So, I mean, it's amazing how digital is transforming India. Where there's DigiLocker, government identities issued digitally, uh, know your customer is digital. So right now, this, this digital revolution in India, in many ways, is transforming the economy. I wanted to give you another example of how this is improving quality of life. Next, please. So now you can see uh, what we call India stack through digital public infrastructure. Important to note that this is all in the public domain. And that's one of the comparative advantages of India, where for improving quality of life for an aspirational India, India is going rapidly, going paperless, cashless, presenceless, and it's consent-based. So you can use Aadhaar for, for banking. So if you look at the DigiLocker for documents, Coven is the vaccine platform. 
is an online system for life insurance. And then, of course, cashless. We just saw the huge numbers of transactions which are taking place as you, as we speak. And, you know, again, in many countries in the world, including the US, you don't have to go too many times to a government office. In India, till about seven or eight years ago, you had to go to the Tessildar's office. You had to go for, you know, you had to repeatedly go and meet a human being. And, of course, that led to rent. Now, increasingly, you know, the role of government is critical, obviously, but you don't necessarily have to go to a low-level government office to renew something or to open something. You can do an electronic uh, KYC, utility payment, many of the things all of us and all of you take for granted have actually happening in India. And of course, Aadhaar-based or authentication for banking. Next, please. So I think this is my last or penultimate slide. India, as you know, is holding the G20 presidency at the moment. And in the G20 presidency, uh, as Amitabh Sherpa is going to tell you, perhaps later today or tomorrow, it's, uh, you know, the theme is one, one family, one earth, one world, or Vasudev Kutumbakam, which means the world is one family. And I think the India story is going to resonate around the world. So whether it's South-South or South-North, I just wanted to leave these numbers with you. The digital economy and uh, data for governance are going to be key themes of the G20. In addition to reform of the multilateral institutions, climate, obviously, uh, uh, the energy transition, women empowerment, but digital is going to be key. And remember that still in the world today, there are 4 billion people who don't have a digital identity. There are 2 billion people who are unbanked and you know, more than 100 countries deal in cash. And this is really where India's experience at all. It's already been getting translated to the world, but I think it's important to recognize that it's a big opportunity for India, but also for countries from the South, and India would like to be the voice of those countries in the G20 negotiations as well. So it's not just in India. I think this is an experience which can be translated around the world. And uh, I think the country, the government and the country is whole of government and the whole of country. This experience, while we continue to move along our own development path, it's uh, important to recognize that this experience, these lessons can be shared with the world. I, I believe that's my last slide. But let me see if there any more. Is there another slide? Uh, okay. This is a little bit of uh, what Niti Aayog has been focusing a lot on. Just to give you another story on aspirational India. You know, startups, no one is really talking about startups. And in the Silicon Valley where you all are, I guess this is even more interesting. A lot of you are involved, a lot of people from uh, this part of the world. And a lot of the Indians in that part of the world have been closely involved with this story. But how... The startup ecosystem, and in Niti, we have the Atal Innovation Mission, which sort of helps to promote this, this, this revolution which started about eight or nine years ago. So today, actually, that 80K is actually close to 100,000 100, startups. You can see the numbers. It's an exploding ecosystem where there's unicorns, more than 100, or startups. This has exploded in the last six or seven years. And again, it's driving growth. Now it's gone into the ag sector, this year's budget set up an accelerator to promote ag, agri-business startups. And so it's cutting across sectors. It's, you know, it's not just in sort of tech, et cetera. The India stack story is helping and drive the startup revolution as well. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, let me quickly run through the, the other part of the middle class aspiration story. I'm not going to run through this, but you can see how in terms of infrastructure as well, there's a, a huge, I mean, there's a demand and this is from the middle class and this is the response, whether there's road network or 5G rollout, which is going to be the fastest in the world or the metro system, you can see that urbanization, which is, you know, a, a major growth trend and a challenge and an opportunity in India, the infrastructure needs to keep pace with that. There's a lot more work to be done and not to minimize the challenges, but a lot has already happened. Next, please. 
And if the social infrastructure for an aspirational India, whether you look at the health insurance system, whether you look at the growth of the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences, the premier medical uh, colleges in India, whether you look at engineering. Uh, so there's an explosion in terms of services, which typically the middle class would demand as they move out of that poverty bracket. So this is keeping pace. It's a story which perhaps we need to tell better, but there's a lot moving for the aspirational India. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much for the patient hearing and happy to take a few questions, Amit, if there's time. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, we will like to open it up for questions. We have about seven minutes for questions. Uh, anybody, uh, could you just come on the podium in the front and ask the question? Uh, but uh, before somebody comes in, I, I have a question for you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, if I really look at this, like what, what are those big three or four principles that the world can follow if they have to emulate what India has actually been able to do at the scale and speed uh, of implementation and things? Yeah. Look, I think that there are a couple of things which are which particularly work well for India and have worked well in the last seven or eight years. One is clearly there's a very strong political leadership which underpins all the development which has taken place in India. And there's so that has made a huge difference, whether it's in the social sector, whether it's in the economic reform sector. I mean, if you talk of the GST, if you talk of the production link incentive program. The, the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So I think there's, an, there's a confidence in the business community, ease of doing business, that, you know, this is, India is open for business. That's on the economic front, right? And you have compliances reduced. So there's a big trust in sort of making life easier for business. And then the equally important political push to improving the quality of life. So that's number one, the political leadership. The second is, I think, an understanding of development from the grassroots and what really works on the ground, which you know I don't think we've seen before to that extent. It's an understanding of what works. It's a focus on delivery, on monitoring, and on quality. You know, in the old days, I used to do a bit of work on monitoring and evaluation. And what is a sign of a good indicator? We call it, and Amit, you know that better than anyone else, QQT, quantity, quality, time. So the time factor, mission mode, has become critical. It's not an unending incremental process where in the fullness of time things will happen. So that kind of focus, and then finally I would say the federal system, what we call in India cooperative competitive federalism. India has got 36 states and you have done a lot of ranking. So therefore, how do you get everyone on board? How do you engage with state governments and make sure that if India wants to become a $5 trillion economy, Every state has its own inclusive growth target. So I think those three or four factors have really uh, led to a transformation of India in terms of both the economic story, but also the social story. Thank you. And we have a question from the audience. Uh, could you just come here and uh, ask the question, please? Uh, overall, all that you shared is obviously great. Um, how do you balance that with the concept of privacy, right? So in the US, we are more into privacy. Uh, so can you share your thoughts on that? Uh, because it seems like if you keep on crossing that, you get into privacy of people, and then it can be misused by other folks uh, who are uh, wrong actors. Uh, and any other trade-offs in going so deep and fast? Thank you. Sure. Look, I think that's a very important question. And I think that from a policy perspective, uh, data privacy particularly in the digital revolution is, is very, very important. It's a high, very high priority for the government. So there's a you know, data privacy from a legislative point of view, but also from an institutional point of view is key. And so it's, it's equally important. We have, you know, our institutions, whether you look at, you know, the, the government system or the media or the judiciary, that's very much on the cards. And therefore, if you look at Aadhaar, Aadhaar has got very strict data privacy provisions uh, and you know those need to be you know are being strengthened and it's an important aspect to consider as you have suggested as we move along with the digital revolution in particular 
Uh, Richard, you have a question, please. Uh, Richard, yes. there's a special person here. He's the co-creator of the conference with me at Stanford. Uh, so Richard, you have a question over to you. So I did want to start by saying thank you so much for uh, presenting, and we're sorry you couldn't make it in person. But I was uh, very impressed with your slide about India possibly being a model for the rest of the world in terms of how to digitize, digitalize in a productive way. As you go to the World Bank, do you have suggestions for how India can uh, have a good impact on the rest of the world? Well, it's a great question, Richard, and I think that's uh, going to be one of the high priorities uh, for the bank. It, it has been for a while, but I think the ability uh, for the bank to act as a facilitator and a convener for South-South cooperation and knowledge sharing I think that will only increase as we go forward. There are so many lessons which India can share with other southern countries, uh, in, in particular in Africa, uh, which I think that's going to be a very important agenda going forward. Just one quick example of how that the demand is also pulling that. In my previous job, we had organized an international conference on, on sanitation and to share the lessons of the Swaj Bharat mission. And we had invited 55 health and sanitation ministers from around the world. And when we introduced them to what was happening in India, they were really keen to, you know, to pick up those lessons and mainstream them in their own countries. So there was a big request. It was interesting that the health ministers understood the importance of sanitation as a public good. It was its impact on health or the environment or the economy. But they said, can we get Prime Minister Modi to talk to our heads of government and heads of state, to tell them how he did it, and also to emphasize the importance of public finance for public goods. So if you're, how do you convince the finance minister of Nigeria? The Nigerian minister for sanitation, Suleiman Adamu, was wanting to champion sanitation, but he couldn't convince his government to invest in sanitation, which I don't know if Richard Damania is there. He's a good friend from the bank who's done a lot of work to show that there's a five is to one return on investment if you invest in sanitation. And therefore, there was a big requirement for a sort of political uh, engagement where Prime Minister Modi could talk to heads of governments and, and tell them how he did it and why he invested in a public good like sanitation. So huge scope. And I think the World Bank is already playing an important role and, and perhaps can step it up in terms of putting out some of these stories from India and lessons for the southern world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paramji. Thank you. Like, uh, as all things need to close, we have to move to a next session with the minister. Uh, but Paramji, like, something very, very powerful, as you say, and what I read recently in your article, it's about that 4S framework. It is Sampanta, which is prosperity, Surakshit Bhavishya, uh, uh, secured future, Shreshth Jeevan, great quality of life, and Saralta, ease of doing things. So I think this is encapsulates as to what the policy for the government of India has been, and that's actually been the pillar of uh, governance and implementation over the last few years. Thanks a lot for joining in here. Uh, special thanks from my side and Richard's side and Stanford's side for really being part of this uh, debate and the India Dialogue. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>